the head of hotel relations. So you give her a big round of applause for making it. I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, so, in the past, this has been a much uh, deeper topic to discuss than a lot of the other things, uh, and you might see us have looks of panics if you ask us questions about it, because it is, it can be a very hard topic to talk about, and so that's why we have Silver Club here. Oh, God. Yo. Simple as it. Yes. Um, so everyone I'm sure has read at least one point on fan fiction. You found some story that starts with the phrase something like Luna's Moon Smile. This is three words, very powerful opening statement, because it implies several things at us all at once. The physical impression of the moon in the shape of a crescent symbolizing the smile uh, is implied but also the sense of peace, of happiness, of compassion, of a tranquil night established in three words that sets a tone and a scene far faster than any amount of lengthy exposition could have. It is a language that speaks directly to the mind's eye bypassing the verbal filter and tugging on the emotional cores uh, of people's writing. One of the keys to moving any story from the realm of simple fiction into literature is in the art of speaking not just what is written on the page, but in the subtexts, in the connotations of the words that connect to the parts of the brain that can't be directly hit just by reading words on a page. Anybody can put words on a page. Everybody does put words on a page. This is an inevitability. We are a verbal species. We communicate with one another through writing, through words, through speech. And we do this all the time. Every day I'm doing it right now. Um, I'm using language to communicate, but I'm using very straightforward language. I'm using very denotative language. I'm using language that is explicitly designed to communicate the ideas contained within the words themselves. I am not directly attempting to connect what I'm saying in this moment with any kind of deeper sense, any kind of emotional content. I'm simply trying to express ideas and let you think about them. But when we want to make a deeper impression, when we want to leave lasting uh, impacts, there is a second language available to us, a language of symbolism, a language of metaphor, a language of allegory, a language of connected ideas that when we speak of one, tug subtly on other strands within our linguistic network. And one of the things I think that uh, um, attracted uh, a lot of us to the show to begin with is the fact that that symbolism is so rich within it. I mean, from the very first minute of the show, uh, we have the story of the two sisters, the, the princesses, and um, right away, uh, their links to the sun and the moon uh, make them more than just ponies. The fact that they're rulers of their kingdom make them more than just ponies. Uh, and then, you know, the fact that they are sisters and share this family bond, all of a sudden, you know, within one or two sentences from the start, you are building up this entire web of relationships. Even one step before that, the very title of the show, My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. We've established within the first six words the, the very shortest phrase that Ernest Hemingway ever tried to turn into a story. <laughs> we have established the fundamental metaphor of the show itself. The idea that our social connections are themselves a source of power. Um, and going back to the opening scene of the very first episode of the book, you have 
the book is explaining something. It, it's used to explain the story and a lot of symbolism within it. And then you find out it's Twilight reading it. It it's, ends up being the main character. And how would you describe Twilight? One of the commonest scriptures is bookish. They don't have to say bookish because it, the series opens with her reading a book and taking this book very seriously. So you're, you can establish more than just a meaning between characters. You can establish internal meaning for characters by the actions that they take. And what people, I mean, you've heard it before, judge people by their, what they do, not what they say. Uh, in, our everyday act, in our everyday, our actions kind of symbolize who we are. We judge people based off of it. So, in, in, in actually, the, the book is a really good point because all the way throughout the series, the books themselves serve books throughout the series serve as a symbol, as a stand-in for various things. In the very first opening segment, we have the story of the two sisters. We have the book, the elements of harmony. We have the the encapsulation of the friendship of the main sex in a text describing the nature of the interrelations of these elements. The book is a symbol for their friendship. In season two, we have the book that Celestia and Luna pick up and hold, in which when, they beat Dis when the main six defeat Discord, at one point you see Celestia close a book and make it poof away. We see the same book appear again at the beginning of season three. What is this book? It is the symbol of prophecy. It is Twilight's destiny, writ out in front of her, that Celestia and Luna are perhaps watching, perhaps writing as Twilight evolves. And then in season four, how does season four capture? We have gone from Twilight being the subject of a book to being the author of a book. Twilight has taken control of her own destiny. She and her friends have moved from the role of characters in another person's story to being characters in their own histories, to be the authors of their own destiny, and to creating their own stories through the symbolism of a book. Well, and when you have something where it's symbolism like the book for Twilight, you have uh, different symbolisms matching up. You have the book from the original show, you have the book, as you said, Celestia and Luna closed when they defeat, defeat uh, what is this word of Sombra? I thought there was a bunch of it's, it's There's Sombra room for Sombra as well. Sombra and Discord are the same book, if yes. I'm not mistaken. It's, it's the black book with the yeah. sun and moon on the front. But you keep seeing uh, the same things come up. And when you have reoccurring symbolism, it can gain power. You see this a lot in stories where someone has some, a character will have a trait or something that they do or something that they say. And then later on, that, that line that's been said a dozen times before suddenly has a lot more meaning. You see it in romances where someone will have something that they say to the other person, the other pony. And then, yeah, it becomes just a normal thing that they do, but then Later on, there's a, there's a challenge or something to overcome, and, and, no, and they don't know what's going to happen, and one character will turn to the other and say the phrase that has always been there as part of the relationship, and it symbolizes that they are there for each other, that it's their relationship, that they are, um, that they are meaningful to each other, but they don't say, I, you know, I love you. What's the line of Han Solo when he goes into Kryptonite? Leia says, I love you, and he looks at her and says, I know. And that's, that was Adelaide. That was a very powerful Adelaide mm -hmm. at the time. And that, uh, I've heard it described as, um, from a number of girls as, be still my heart when he, when he said that. From back in the day, there's a couple of famous interviews where they said that. But having something where you're not saying something, but you're saying something is very deep and meaningful with personal connections. When you tug on the metaphor. In fact, My Little Pony is right for symbols. Oh, okay. yeah. They're on everyone's butts. <laughs> <laughs> the cutie mark is itself a language of symbolism yep. because it doesn't just mean what it says. It does not itself say what it means. It is an impression. It is open to interpretation. There has been, there have been a, a thousand fan works or more, easily more, of 
Is it that the cutie mark defines what the pony does? Or is it that the cutie mark inspires the pony to become? What is the symbol on Twilight's butt? And, and that's honestly sort of the power of symbolism in this case. It's because it isn't a, a single specific meaning, you have the ability to do that sort of interpretation. That's, that's what symbolism is when you talk about it. Uh, what, what, a, what a good symbol is is something that can have multiple interpretations and, and mean multiple things at different times. And um, it, okay. yeah, it, it's, it's that conversion from one to the other that's so relevant. Twilight's symbol is the symbol of magic. The stars, wherever they've shown up on other ponies, have been a symbol of magic. Shining Armor has three stars on his shield because of the strength of his force field. Trixie. Trixie has uh, the star and the uh, one. Well, she has, she has, she has, she has the moon. It's the moon. Yeah. But she has like stars all over her cape as wrapping herself in the symbols of magic. But she is not herself a maid. She is a magician, a stage magician. But she wraps herself in the idea of magic because her st stars cover her cloak. But then you look at Twilight's uh, symbol a little bit deeper. You take it down one level, and it is one purple star surrounded by five white ones. Well, and even even her name is you know Twilight is. The, the thing that connects the day and the night. Mm -hmm. and um, one of the things, I guess, the dawn as well. And, and there you go, she, she helped return Luna, the princess of the night, to the princess of the day. So as you can see, this is uh, some pretty powerful stuff and we've just barely scratched the surface. So the question is, you know, how do we get this into our stories? You know, how can we make this work for us? And I think that's a, that's a good topic to uh, just sort of start, uh, you know, turning towards. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, can I take it? Can I actually, no, I, I want to divert from that a little bit. Okay. One of the things that's actually important to understand about symbolism is that the meanings that you do get, even though they, they can stand for multiple things, the meaning that you do get is, is, is purely derived from context and culture. So, for example, a star on its own is meaningless, but a star shown right after you see a sun and a moon, or between the two, that has more meaning to it. Um, or, or even even just just the shape itself. I mean, that that comes from um, you know. Well, let me, let me let me step a little bit away from pony. For example, if you see a cross, everyone knows that that's has, that's a Christian symbol, and that has a whole lot of connotation to it. If, if you see a, a sword. That that has that is a symbol of itself um, as as well. Uh, it could mean war. It could mean protection. It could mean a lot of things. But usually, it implies some kind of force. Actually, on the simple thing, uh, I actually have a personal favorite on this one, and you're going to have to forgive me because I'm going to goblinize this conversation. Go for it. The shastika. Yes, that's a big one. Instantly, especially when said with that connotation, everyone gets one powerful image. We all know what it is, I'm not going to get into details because I don't want to drag things in that direction, but the reason that symbol was chosen was because it predates the National Socialist Movement. It is a Buddhist symbol of power, and it has been for a thousand years. But today we look at it and we see it only in the context of its World War II connotation. The symbol has in its own way been broken. Because we can't look at it in the lens of its original uh, meaning. Because it was used so powerfully by someone else who wanted to evoke that meaning. That idea of a transcendent power. That to think of it in its original religious context has become harder. And so this, this idea of language, oh, this, this idea of symbols themselves having multiple meanings is something that we, we that, that is in fact part of their goal. Yes. Well, um, to extend on the, the multiple meanings theme and specifically in terms of the swastika, not only is it the Buddhist symbol or the a Buddhist symbol of power, um, it was used during the First World War in which Hitler did serve um, as, uh, as a good luck charm. 
worn by, by many soldiers. And so in, in the going theme of multiple meanings, not only is it to represent the power that the symbol is originally designed to do, it is also to represent a clarion call to all the disenfranchised veterans of said war to come together in one national socialist movement towards a, an end. Right. Now I want to take that and drop it because I literally only wanted to touch it for the, for the Actually, no, I, I will transfer that into how you can use symbolism in the story. Uh, I read a book for high school called The German General's Talk. On it is a swastika. I hide it in my car and someone walked by and they were like, uh, just to be clear, are you a Nazi? And I'm like, why do you say that? Like, well, there's this book in the car and I couldn't see the title. It just has a swastika. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 if you research for a project, there's a very old book, it was written right after World War II, it was, it was, a best, it was one of the better selling books at the time about World War II because a American or a English uh, author went and asked the German generals about the strategy, it, was, it wasn't about the politics, it wasn't about anything else, it was just the strategies used. At the time when they put the swastika on the book, it was not that big of an issue, I mean, People look at it and they look at it and they try to understand why someone has a book with a swastika on it. Nowadays, when you look at something like that, the imagery that comes to mind is not just World War II and from the movies and the books and games that we've played, read, and viewed, but also other groups have taken that symbol and done more with it. So, so when, when you're getting into a story, you can actually change a symbol within a story by referencing it in different ways, and suddenly the meaning has changed. The use of a symbol in multiple contexts is one of the ways in which we reinforce the ideas. I mentioned Luna's moon. Luna's moon smiled. How many other ways can we think of Luna's moon interacting with us? The moon glares down upon us. The moon is hidden from us. The moon shies away behind the clouds. The moon smiles. The moon shines. We have a clear. We have a beacon. We have uh, a happiness. We have a uh, hiding. We have a hidden moon. We have a secret moon. We have the same symbol. The idea of a princess watching over us in all of these different contexts that we never talk about Luna directly, we never reference what the Princess of the Night is doing, but we have the emblem of her presence that we can refer to, and we can show the ways in which Luna approves or disapproves, is empowered or uh, enervated through our story by the ways in which the moon itself changes shape. I see a hand in the back. Um. What other literary devices would you guys be talking about and how we use them? Oh goodness, I could fill an hour on symbolism alone. <laughs> but the question is what other literary devices oh, are there that we can talk about? There is an entire... So, whenever we talk about literary devices, the first thing I want to do is tell everybody if you go out and you hit the web and you search for literary devices, you will hit everything from... There are pages upon pages upon pages dedicated to talking about various ideas, but there are a couple that I can pull forward very quickly. There's an idea of metonymy. Metonymy is where we use a part to represent the whole. When we talk about a pilot, when we talk about the pilot, we are talking about the ship. When we talk about the wheels, my wheels are outside. Well, they're not just wheels. If I had a pile of wheels, that's not very impressive. But when I say, my wheels are out back, everyone knows I'm talking about my car. Well, and it highlights the fact that the car is probably a faster car. When you say, my wheels, um, it's, yeah, I got good wheels. I got, I got a car that can really go. Mm -hmm. And the ways in which we describe it, it is itself a form of symbolism, but it's the ways in which we reduce ideas to the things that represent them themselves. Yes? That's often used in music, like Baby Got Back, you know, they're describing aspects of a person as... Mm -hmm. What is this mad beat to which you're listening? Well, it's <laughs> not just the beat. If it were just the beat, boom, boom, boom. I could sit here for an hour and no one would give me a record deal. <laughs> <laughs> but what is this mad beat? It's the song, but we refer to it by one component because it's the component that stands out and drives the impression. My God, what is this melody I'm hearing? 
Well, there's all the other pieces to it too, unless you're listening to a solo. But it is the, the fundamental element of the thing that you're describing that strikes us and stands out. Yeah, and in terms of uh, uh, literary devices, uh, I mean, that's actually a kind of a broad term. Uh, we've been talking about stylistic literary devices, uh, you know, such as symbolism and autonomy. Uh, I mean, the term itself actually covers everything from, like, you know, foreshadowing to which, uh, you know, whether you're using first or second or third person, person narration, uh, to even, you know, things like exposition. Uh, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different uh, literary devices that, uh, you know, get covered under the umbrella and we can sort of, you know, range through those as, as there's interest. The idea of a literary device itself is not really a symbol, but <laughs> I was going to try, try to pull that off and then I realized I couldn't quite do it. The idea of a, a literary device itself in concept is something that you do to your writing to speak not directly what the words on the page are, but to try to evoke a sense in your reader that extends purely beyond the denotative or even the connotative value of the words on the page. When we write poetry, we focus on rhyme and meter. We focus on the flow of words, the, the ebb and flow, the patterns that come out in the way we talk. The rhyme scheme that we pick causes the brain to hearken back naturally to other pieces of the thing we've just been hearing. It, it becomes an echo in our head of the language, of the words, and it, it creates a, a musical impression. Prose doesn't inherently have this, but the poetics of language carry through into the way we write, alliteration, long languid liquid sounds, short, short sentences. The context, the, the, the words that we use, the word choice that we make when describing something is itself symbolic. Yeah, I was connected. If I could play off of that a little bit, actually that has to do with also how you choose to name things, for example, in, in, your, in your stories. Um, certain sounds in the English language carry with them a, a kind of inherent meaning. It's a vague meaning, is but they the do. Is this the booba? What? Is this the booba? Are you going to do the booba? No, go ahead. Oh. I, I don't know. If you've already got this prepared, I was just... Oh, well, there's a very famous psychological experiment in which people... I wish I had do, do, no paper. I, I'm in a room full of writers. Somebody has paper. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't bring any. I, I failed. She's been running around helping everyone else. So. I was almost tardy. Do we have a tardy. pen? Do we have a pen? I was almost tardy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Send you back to convention <laughs> kindergarten. No. At least you got At least it's not magic kindergarten. <laughs> yeah. No. So there was a very famous experiment, and I want to pass this around to people. There's a very famous psychological experiment in which these two shapes were handed to people who spoke various languages. And they were asked, one of these is a booba. <laughs> one of these is a kiku. Which is which? One of these symbols, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, is very puffy and bulbous. <laughs> it's very rounded cloud -like. and cloud-like, and one of these is very sharp, it's angular, it has lots of points on it. And people were asked, which is which, a booba and a kiku? And 90% of the people who answered said the bulby, puffy, cloud-like thing was a booba, and the pointy thing was a kiku. And it didn't matter what the native language of the speaker was, presented with a pair of nonsense sounds, and a pair of abstract syllables, people identified one shape with one sound and not the other. Better than three standard two standard deviations. You're not going to get that kind of odds anywhere on a gambling table. <laughs> and so when you start to think about what is the impact of the sound of my story, what are the, what, how do I want to make my story sound, when I pick it up and I read it aloud, what are the impact 
What, what is the impact on the ear? What is the impact on the mind's eye of the sounds of my story, independent of the words on the page and their meaning? Snape. Yeah. Immediately, as soon as you hear the name, you think, this per I can't this trust man. this person. But I will also say that it starts sharp, but it's... Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the series, spoiler alert, <laughs> at the end of the series, he was doing some things that were good despite all the actions that he took that were... He was sneaky. He was sneaky. But at the end, he ended softer than he started. Mm -hmm. So you have symbolism where it's not just the idea, when I mean, you hear the S for the S, so you think, you immediately, it's a harsh version of, a harsh view of him, and it helps create that without ever having to describe him at all. <coughs> yeah. yeah, I think, also with Harry Potter, I think the first time Ron hears the name Tom Marvolo Riddle, he said he sounds like a dirty rotten snitch. <laughs> something, something like that. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, it's, so, even something as simple as names, and now think about ponies and names of ponies. Twilight Sparkle, we've already covered her. Slender Shy. Slender Shy. <laughs> rainbow! Dash! What is a rainbow? I tried rainbows and I tried dashing, I'm out of ideas. <laughs> rainbow Dash is vibrant, she's brash, she's vivid, she's in everybody's face, she's fast, she's athletic. It's right there in her name, but it's not hammered anywhere. Applejack's the weird one. It really is, because the first time I heard her, I said, you gave the name of Brandy? <laughs> wait, 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 I can actually explain this a little bit. And it's, Applejack is the name from season, from the very first generation of ponies. Mm -hmm. Who's a comfy pony? Who is you? Is Applejack? Yep. Yep. Symbols of my people. Yeah. Hey. Excellent. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Congratulations. We we will be talking Why? about those later when he does that as well. Rarity. Refined. Unique. Unusual. Even her language, darling. <laughs> she speaks, she, she talks this way, but her name itself implies bespoke artisanship. It, it speaks to an idea of being one of a kind, of being something you can't just find on the racks somewhere. It's something hand hoofcrafted, something special. Thank you, Pinkie Pie. 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 Lots of very short, very bouncy syllables. We talked about this. Yeah. Mine is strawberry milk. We can't get into that syllable. <laughs> I have to warn you all. In my off hours, when I'm not doing this, I run a furry con. <laughs> so. There, there's, a, there's a limit to the symbolism that I can go into in this <laughs> But the thing is that the, we also see that symbolism extending both, uh, beyond the main characters. Uh, I mean, for example, you look at the names Celestia and Luna. Luna is the moon. That is, you know, you, we talk about uh, lunar cycles. Um, but we don't have Solaris or... We, or Solaria. Yeah, or Solaria or anything. We have Celestia. And something that is celestial encompasses the entire heavens. And here we have her introduction is in the role of the manager of everything because her sister's been banished. Well, even after that, she still gives the impression of being the slightly more in charge princess. Yeah. And Luna, who just has domain of the moon, well, of the night, but, uh, um, you know, uh, Luna is, like, the moon is reflecting the sun's light. She is always, in a sense, in her sister's shadow, and I think that's part of the thing that has attracted us, uh, attracted us to her uh, as a character. She has these depths that uh, um, Celeste just overpowers all the time. Well, even in the season four finale, they use that, uh, you know, in the song that the Celestia and Luna are singing, Luna talks about the fact that she is overshadowed all the time and she has to wait for her chance to shine. Mm -hmm. so. well, we've talked a lot 
lot about some of the shows, but how about we talk about some of the symbolism and the other literary devices we've seen in fan fiction that stand out to us? And I can start by saying, uh, in Fall of Crestria, you have the Pip Buck. The main character is Little Pip. The main character starts off as a Pip Buck repair pony. It's brought up at the very beginning. It's even explicitly called out. The Pip Buck, everyone has it, no one does it properly. No one uses it properly. They use it for music, but it can be used for so much more. And the character, main character got her key mark spoiler at, for chapter one. <laughs> when she, when a fool was lost and they couldn't locate her just with the, with the, uh, the Pip Buck telling them where it was. Well, the main character knew that there's some areas that there's interference. And so she knew that, that if the Pip Buck doesn't say it, if looking up for, for her Pip Buck doesn't show her up, it means she's in the missing child is one of these three or four areas. And she goes and looks and finds it. And that's how she gets her cutie mark, something that is completely normal that everything has, but she does it better. There's a lot of heroes in Fallout Equestria. There's all the companions that the character looks up to for various reasons. But they all look toward her, the main character, because even though she's just like all the others, she does it a little bit better. She uses it everything that she can to its fullest extent. And later on in her pip buck, pip, pip buck, buck uh, I believe it breaks for a little while. Um, pip buck breaks. I can't know that this that hurts. It does. But it, you know what? It hurt the character. Well, I'm saying the, the, the sound itself, to try to say those things right there, it's, it's, it's tongue twisting, it's, it's, it's complicated to say, and doing that kind of implies the, the idea that this is a difficult subject. And for several chapters after that, until she either repairs or gets a new pit button, it, um, it, it's hard on her. She's like, I keep wishing that, you know, she kept saying that she wishes she had her pit button. And how much easier it would be. She could just do this, she could just do that, but she can't. She has to find another way to do it. Eternal. Okay. Has anyone in here read Eternal? Okay. Go read Eternal. <laughs> I don't make many, I don't, I, I don't typically advocate like this. This is one I have to advocate for. Because in it we see Celestia not just as the, as the sun, but very explicitly as the eternal sun, the constant sun, the presence that is always there, that has been there for a thousand plus years, rising and falling with regularity, long past the point at which the sun needed to set and rest, fighting against destiny, fighting against her own nature, and the nature of the sun itself to move in cycles. What does the sun do? It shines, but it rises and it falls. It, it doesn't wax and wane over time. It is in its own way constant. It doesn't change shape. Its nature is somewhat fixed, but it rises in the morning. It shines during the day and it sets at night. And for a thousand years, Celestia has shined, has shown. But the time is coming when the sun must set. And Celestia is afraid. Um, and for my part, I'm going to uh, say, uh, what does Princess Celestia drink? Come on, everybody knows this one, right? Tea, yeah, it's tea, see. Uh, Skyrunner wrote, wrote a story called Princess Celestia Hates Tea. Oh, it's, it's all three days now where he mentioned that thing. You should go read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, the thing is that, uh, I mean, in terms of symbolism, here the tea is standing in for a great many things. Uh, and when she, when the truth comes out that she uh, is not actually a fan of tea, even though she's been drinking it for a thousand years, society completely breaks down. It, 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 it is like, it is completely useless without her, you know, drinking that tea every day. Uh, and so, in a way, it's, it's representing the wider society itself. It's representing that social order. We're talking about that metonymy, you know, wheels are a car. Here, we have a story where that tea is literally the entirety of equestrian society. <laughs> That's the one for it. It's a very and it's funny. And it's kind of a lie, and that's. Yeah. And everyone just assumes it's not true. Yeah. 
You have, you have a story? No, no. You're sitting up here. I know. I, I, I do that. How about your? How about that hat? We, we put. Oh, this one? Yeah. Yeah. Darren Goose hat? Yeah. Sure. We we put. Is well, that a symbol? Well, yeah. Of course, it's a symbol. Everything's a symbol. Yeah. Right? That's Go. The, that's the thing. That, all right, fine. Then, then so so the the, the pith helmet that Darren Goose wears. Um, well, it symbolizes that she's obviously an adventurer, somebody who goes exploring those places where ponies don't normally go. And so that also implies certain character traits about her. Just the fact that she wears it implies that she likes that sort of thing. She likes adventure, she likes pushing herself and exploring. And so she, that, that also implies that there's probably some, an element of bravery to her. There's probably an element of heroism to her. I'll give you one better. What's that? What if she hates her hat? Oh, well, yeah, you can totally write a story about that, how it's, I don't know, imposed upon her, birthright or something like that. Imagine a story in which Daring Do hates that terrible hat because of all the troubles that it has gotten her into. Yeah, yeah. Indiana Jones, briefly, is defined <coughs> as a character, as a hat and a whip. And there's a very famous scene, I believe it's in the very first... Yep. Where he loses his hat and reaches under a dropping stone platform to grab his hat and yank it out at the last minute. Because it's that important. Because it, because it's that important to the character. It is a symbol of his adventure. And he doesn't wear it in the classroom. When he puts on the hat, he becomes a new person. He goes from Professor Jones to Indy Save Me! <laughs> and he loves that hat, but there are times when he has to take it off. The Mare Do Well costume is a symbol <coughs> that every pony, except Dash, because that was a terrible episode, <laughs> wears at least once to symbolize the depths to which people are willing to go. But when they put it on, they're very different. They're the silent, strong protector, but they take it off. What is the relationship that everyone has to that costume? Dash hates it. Dash hates that costume with a burning passion. Why? Because it's a representation of what she wasn't allowed to be, what she couldn't be. Pinkie Pie loved it because it let her do things that she couldn't get away with when she wasn't wearing it. <laughs> because they would have let a masked crusader do anything. And if she had to do it, they'd make her pay for him. <laughs> And so we have not just a symbol, but a complicated set of relationships with it that change over time. Mysteri there's a story, Games We Play, I think it is, is another one, where the symbol of the, the suit itself, it, it, it's, it's a love story, it's a romance, I ship, <laughs> between Dash, who, comes, who evolves from hating that costume, to wanting to understand it, to want to want to know what would drive somebody to wear it. And Pinky's relationship with it as it goes from something she's doing to try to help somebody to a prison. The costume is at one point compared to a cell that sometimes she can get out of because she can take it off, but she's always compelled to go back to it because of what it lets her do. And this is another way in which we, we evolve our relationships, is we change our symbols over time. The thing that meant something to us, the, the childhood toy, Miss Smarty Pants. <laughs> Miss Smarty Pants is a powerful symbol. Miss Smarty Pants starts out lesson zero as the most important thing in her toy chest, because it is a symbol of all the happiness she had in youth, not being picked on by other kids because she didn't know any. And then it becomes the symbol of the source of her troubles because she doesn't understand other ponies and she doesn't understand how to interact with them. And so Miss Smarty Pants becomes the element of social complication. It becomes a geek social fallacy all by itself. And then at the end, it becomes a symbol of reconciliation. I don't need this anymore. I can give this to somebody who needs it more than I do, and maybe they'll get out of it what I got when I needed it most. 
And then Big Mac yep. Pie. Big Mac Pie. <laughs> and so again, we have, we have this powerful literary device, the idea that there is something in our story that stands in for a mindset of the character. And it changes over time. As the character's relationship with it changes, the character's relationship with the thing it represents changes. Or the thing that it represents changes itself. So one of the things that, you know, people who come here, we're all, a lot of people here have the writer's itch. So what can we and all do? I had that one, so yeah. <laughs> have something to eat and lie down and go away. <laughs> A lot of people might be looking to include more symbolism in their story, and there's a couple different ways that can help people do that. One is if you look back in history at things that have been symbols, a heart, a red rose, a white rose, a white dress, actually, they all have historical symbolic meaning. You can find things uh, that work. Yeah, absolutely. Pull, pull it out of your own culture. I mean, you are talking to people. I mean, your audience is people who probably come from a similar background as you. So there's no reason why you can't pull the symbols out of out of your own culture in order to. And when you're doing culture like the Pegasi, they take yeah. a lot from the, the Greek and Roman sure. yes. history. So if you want to include something for them, some form of symbolism, you might look towards the cultural inspirations that you that are based that are influencing the culture that you are writing about. Um, another thing that you can do is to flush out your characters and your world. If you have a character who really dislikes tea, every time, but you know, because of the social aspect they need to deal with, they need to sit down, they need to pretend to enjoy the tea. What you end up happening is, you could, you could have done that story completely differently. I mean, yours done well, but this, you could do it completely differently where um, every time the tea is sit down in front of her, you know, it would mean, it would can symbolize that distaste, that the fact that she's doing what she needs to do, not what she wants to do. And so if you are wanting to expand on that thick, that's something that could happen. Can I, can I actually jump in here real quick because I'm going to have to run. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say when you do write, try not to beat people over the head with it. Um, you know, it is possible to use too much symbolism, so to speak, or to try to, to, to use it as a crutch to, um, well, I'll put it this way. If you're trying to write a dramatic scene or have a, a dramatic reveal or something really important happening to your main character, you need to build up the importance of this symbol before you use it in that particular scene. So, well, and it depends on your target audience. When yes. when the tear falls from Twilight in uh, the Discord, the first Discord episodes, and it falls and it lands in the heart that breaks, it's a very obvious beat over the head symbolism. However, the target audience is still a kid's show, and we look at that and go, ugh. But then you realize for a kid, that might be the first time they see something like that. That can be very powerful to the target audience. I like to typically tell people never put symbolism in your stories. <laughs> I'm serious. Never go out of your way to put a symbol in your story. If you go in with the idea that you're going to take this symbol and make a story about it, what's going to happen is it's going to have about the same level of impact that that tear had on all of us. It's going to be great for the person who's never encountered it before, and everyone else is going to go, yes, I get it, red means blood, get on with it. <laughs> but once you've written it, in your first editing pass, go back and look at all of the concrete objects and the language that you use, all the phrases, and you step back and you say, what in here have I described more than once? What in here have I used in this scene that I could briefly mention over here, one sentence touch, in this scene, and this scene, and this scene, and this scene, that will carry through all of these pages of what Celestia's frown looks like because she screwed up and just have the sun pass behind a cloud as Twilight is walking out of the room. Well, and you have to, uh, you're talking about, you know, don't specifically go out of the way to add symbolism, but it's always good to check to make sure you're not accidentally adding symbolism. I like the show MASH. There's an episode where Hawkeye says, I am sick and tired of green. I'm, there's green everywhere, we're in the army, everything is green. 
and he leaves and he comes back and they throw a party and it's, it's the party is all red. And to me, it always bothered me because he's a surgeon. Like, any time he sees red, something has gone terribly, terribly wrong unless he's putting ketchup on something. <laughs> I don't think he could eat ketchup. I don't, I don't think he could eat ketchup. You had a hand, by the way. Um, well, I, if you wanted to finish that idea. Uh, um, well, I think they did it because they wanted to add a joke at the end where a character has red hair, but they could have done the same thing with yellow. And yellow is springtime, the beginning is something changing. It's not just the same drab color. It's not, you know, the color of blood. You could do it where it's something actually different. Um, but I think they didn't realize the symbolism that they're adding at the time, and it ruins the, ruined the whole episode for me. Um, well, one of the, it's not, it, I mean, it, it's in, in a general similar vein, but one of the things I, we've all noticed is that Tony society is, by a very large majority, is female. It appears to be. Mm-hmm. There's, yeah, there's, there's some ratio, something worked out, I forget what it exactly is. It, it, the, the ratio is approximately one girl's cartoon to, <laughs> to all the boys and the soldiers. Yeah. But, but exactly, but that, that was what I was coming to, is, is despite the fact that most of the population appears to be female, every man jack of the, of the guards is a male. And what is arguably the most dangerous profession in the, that a pony can take is, is as a guard. And the other thing we know about the ponies is that they are generally pacifistic. And that I've heard of the suit was cutie mark crusader babysitter. Yeah. But, <laughs> but that the perhaps that is why ponies are almost exclusively pacifistic, is because if there were a conflict, they are risking not only, you know, the lack of security of those fighting, but Quite possibly the perpetuity of their own species. Hmm. Interesting. I, I, I always thought that was an interesting sort of thing that is somewhat underexplored. Mm-hmm. Uh, here in the back. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, one of my favorite things of symbolism that I've seen uh, that I didn't really notice until I read the story twice would be anthropology. And it's not, it's not a big spoiler, but like the very first. In the very last lines that they end on are, are you going to eat that piece of cake? So I was admire to ask the bottom line. And once is, once is in the beginning to very opening up and she's just snapping the bottom line out of her thoughts or whatever. And the end is kind of snapping the bottom line out of her thoughts again. It, the, the idea of a recurring symbol, of recurring language. Um, yeah, and, and yep. Yeah. <laughs> and that's something that we've also seen used very effectively in uh, other fanfic, like, for example, um, Eakin's Hard Reset, which is about uh, time traveling Twilight Sparkle. Uh, every single loop resets back to, well, that, that didn't work. work. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then at the end of the story, you see Spike finally change that, and that's how we know that that's where we get closure uh, in the same sort of way as, you know, that callback. Uh, you know, bringing this sort of closure, uh, you know, in, in anthropology, uh, in, in Hard Reset, breaking that is giving her the closure because the entire story is about her being trapped within those loops. Yes? Uh, you talk a lot about symbolism, and I'm kind of wondering about other literary devices as well, but in, in that context, too, you end up with other things that turn into symbols that are other that are in fact other literary devices. Uh, and a good good example of this would be the core of speech patterns. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I it's one of the principal people stories, I think it's the the strange destination but it might be actually uh, uh, the Prince of Ponyville, I'm not sure. But it talks about how that's a thing among the zebra culture that denotes respect amongst shamans. Uh, and at one point, Zakora purposely switches out of that mode of speech when dealing with a character that she has lost respect for. Uh, so how would you incorporate other literary devices like that particular speech pattern and or the symbolism that goes along with it? The challenge of Zakora's speech pattern, and I... Zakora is a very complicated character, and I want to be very... funny. Yeah. What? Best That's funny. funny. She, she's a good pony. They are all good ponies. Zakora is a very complicated character in general because we only have one zebra in the show. 
And so whenever we see any Zipporah do anything, we are given rise to the idea that this must be what all of them do, because we've never seen any other zebra in the show, and so we only have the one on which to draw. And so we are placed in the uncomfortable position of making assumptions that Zipporah's behavior patterns are somehow average. And... Well, and again, that was one of the things that's in that story, is that it's mm -hmm. not something that all the zebras do. Uh, and this might be unique to that particular fan fiction. It's only the shamans that do it. Uh, that, that do it to each well, other and, and do it to people that are doing And there's a lot of stories. There's versions where she ha is dealing with some, like she's been exiled and as part of her punishment she has to speak that way. There's, she has to a speech impediment to the fact that she um, is unwed at a certain age. I've seen any number of explanations for why she talks the way she does. Everything right up to including somebody talking about Zebrakin as a language having a certain rhyme structure innate to its grammar and attempting to, and the fact that she speaks that way in equestrian indicates that she's not very fluent. Um, so I, I, I have seen a lot of approaches on that subject. Um, the reason why I'm focused so heavily on symbolism, A, is because it's the one literary device we called out the title, um, but also because I could sit here and go on and on and on about other, what? It's okay. It's okay. I, I could. Leave me long enough, you all will file out of the room and I'll still be talking. <laughs> At least until this infernal thing goes off again. Talk about a symbol. <laughs> You talk about a symbol. This thing is sitting here taunting me. <laughs> because any minute it's going to go off on this thing, and then I'm going to go, like, man, I'm going to do a thing. Could break. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the examples that you gave are, are good ones. Um, in fact, how to do exactly that, how to work in that sort of uh, literary device, is that when you see something which the show has introduced but not given a great deal of symbolic meaning to explore the layers beyond that. Uh, and uh, obviously there's a lot of different headcanon ways to, uh, to go about that, and uh, the, you know, all of them have been you know, good, could certainly hang a story around anyone. Anyway. You know, a, a, a good literary, a, a classic literary device that comes up in the poetics of language, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to get the name wrong. I, I know I'm going to get the name wrong on it, so I'm not going to do it. But it's the the reversal of pieces of speech. So when we talk about um, the, the very famous John F. Kennedy speech, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. The idea of taking, I'm going to set this down so I can talk with my hands because it's the kind of person I am. When, when we take two pieces of speech and we reverse the order of them, we're changing the emphasis in the narrative from the front side of the sentence. We're, we're changing where the emphasis on our narrative falls. We, we take the weight of the story, all of the weight of your sentence, of any given sentence, is supposed to fall on the subject. And so when we use, for example, passive voice, we're deliberately pulling the subject out and we're left with kind of a, we, I, we, we talk about don't use passive voice, the reason is, is the subject is the focus of every sentence. S sentences with passive voice hide their subjects buried within the context of the sentence or rip it out entirely and make it a vague, amorphous things that happened out there. Mistakes were made. The idea that, well, something went wrong, but it's not my responsibility takes it and moves the, it, it, it indicates a level of guilt in the speaker because it refuses to acknowledge who made mistakes. You know, when, when Ray in Ghostbusters, when everyone turns it, well, I didn't do anything, I didn't do anything, my mind is totally blank. And everyone turns and looks at Ray and he goes, it just popped in there. <laughs> he didn't do it. He didn't think about marshmallows. It just popped in there. It just sort of happened without his knowing or intent. He did not do Manhattan to a great sugary death. <laughs> it just sort of happened and he was the vehicle through which disaster occurred. And so I think about the Cutie Mark Crusaders and the number of ways in which they could manage to say, well, something went wrong. 
I didn't plan for this to happen. My diagrams were solid. But if only that rope had held. And, and the language of objects taking the place of subjects, of passive voice, of, of bypassing responsibility, of trying to get out of the mindset of, well, I screwed up. The, the, I, and so we get into the idea of how, where do we place the focus? A lot of the course uh, sentences, for example, rearrange the structure so that there's a nice convenient noun to rhyme at the end of a sentence. But in doing so, she puts all of the weight of the sentence on the subject, on the noun, on the very last thing that happens, the thing that lingers in the mind. And at the same time, it kind of pulls a little bit of magic out of it because you have to wait and you've forgotten what she's talking about at the time you know what she's talking about. Um, we do need to clear up in a minute. I, you've had your question for a while. Well, this is actually kind of a comment on the whole uh, zero thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, it very important because that's absolute impossible and probability. So you have like Mr. Rory, one recording about the single zero standing on the couch. Well, in reality, that would never happen because there would be at least two zeros in any given situation because zeros never go anywhere alone. Mm -hmm. And even animal trainers who zeros for movies, they always have another zero standing on because the zero absolutely will not be alone. And they also have no means to keep the zero small. Or one. Sometimes there's <laughs> one. <laughs> well, isn't that right? Yeah, you're going. And then you had a question too, Craig. Is it really? Have I been talking? We might not have time to answer this, but uh, is there any viable way to keep readers from almost reading too far into the story and seeing symbols that aren't actually there? No, and bless them for it. <laughs> <laughs> if you are writing something and people are reading into it, that much, it means you are doing something right in that they are constantly thinking and the more they think about your fic, that means the better your fic has been. And it also means the more that they will drive themselves crazy and thank you for clearing things up later, intentionally or not. The, the, the most, the, the, my favorite story, and I think it's a good one to close on, is, has anyone here seen Twin Peaks? Uh, okay, you heard of Twin Peaks? Everyone here knows who David Lynch is? Yeah. Fears and ter trembles at the name. Yeah. David Lynch was writing the scripts for Twin Peaks about five weeks ahead of filming. And he was cramming them out the door as fast as he could, which meant there was nobody with oversight. Nobody had a foot on the brake on his ideas. And so he was just spinning out and, and going out, and the show ends very abruptly. He did not get removal to continue his Twin Peaks past the, the, the end of, of the cliffhanger that I still to this day hate. Mm -hmm. And about a year later on all fan Twin Peaks on, or all fan TV Twin Peaks on Usenet, which tells you how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, this is natural. Yeah. It is, I went great at 20. My mother went great at 18, she was like, you're finally catching up to me. <laughs> <laughs> you did this to me, yes. <laughs> anyway, there was a post, it was an absolutely gorgeous post. It was somebody who had read all the novels and seen all the shows and watched the movie, and he had this giant, long, rambling, beautiful, I've connected all these dots and I've linked Project Blue Book to the owls, to this, to the lady in the log, and if you don't understand what I'm talking about, it doesn't matter, it's not important. He has this beautiful one, oh my god, no, 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 no. I understand everything I think you've been trying to tell me, except I only need you to answer one question for me, Mr. Lynch. Was Annie a representative of the White Lodge? And David Lynch actually took the time to answer that post. <laughs> one sentence. That would have been a really great idea. <laughs> No, come on, come on. So uh, these are the folks that have been giving out the, the beautiful patches that are iron on. Um, they are, uh, we just want to give them a uh, thank you and give them a, a moment to explain what the patches are because they've been so helpful to us as staff. Um, we did some bags, and actually Steve in the back there, Thunderflesh, you'll see more of him around. 
He's taking photos of all the cosplay, you'll see them online. Um, we did some patches and some bags for writing contests, and we decided to bring free samples from our website, sponsorshipoffers.com, for pretty much everybody. We've gone through $1,500 in patches as soon as these are gone, so um, hope everybody enjoys them, and there's some candy up here, and he's got some uh, derpy and bubbles. And, they, and if you like them and you want to see your art, art of someone else, you can contact them about having them make them for you. They have pretty good services. And there's candy. Yeah. Yay! <laughs>